Well, I assume that by now Landon has been picked up and is, is headed back home. Um, once again, thank you for, for those who, or thank you to those who, who jumped up and helped and uh, provided him with, with care and need. Uh, but thank you also to those who, who prayed. Um, when, when something like that happens in a church, especially in a church service, uh, you really get to see the, the gifts uh, of, of a diverse body like we have. Where you have people that have the, the medical skills and, and jump up and help, and those um, who do not necessarily have the medical skills but know that uh, we serve a God who does. Uh, and, and to those who are asking for help and, and praying for Him, uh, I thank you guys as well. Um, I know that's a, that's a scary situation. Um, believe it or not, my, my family is, is no stranger to that um, uh, my brother is, is someone with low iron, and so he, they were visiting my, my church when we were in college, the church that we went to. Um, we got up to leave, and when Colin stood up, uh, he fell back immediately like that, passed out. Um, so we've done that. I've done that. Um, Landon, is, uh, Landon is going to be okay. We're, uh, we, we, we trust that, that he's in the hands of our Lord. We trust that, that he is being taken care of. Um, so again, thank you guys for, for all that you have done this morning so far. As we uh, continue our service, um, again, I, I thank you for, for bearing with the, the strange order of service that we just did, uh, especially the band who um, f- flexibly figured out how to, to continue on through the service and, and took my cues from standing over there as I'm pointing and, and making hand motions to Brandon. Um, but let, let's continue on to, to study the Word as we're going to continue our series in 1 John chapter 4. Uh, we're going to be in 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, as we, uh, as, as we make our way through this letter. Now, next week, you may be uh, curious if we're still going to be in 1 John uh, when, we, when we talk about Easter. Uh, the answer is yes, because next week, the passage in 1 John is a perfect passage to, to talk about what Christ has done for us and the love that he had for us uh, on the cross. Uh, but for this week, we're in the passage before, verses 1 through 6. Um, as they're, they're, as they're, you guys are turning there, I want to tell you about... Uh, about Everly for a little bit. Uh, most of you, if not all of you, know Everly is my two-year-old. Uh, she's in the nursery back there. Uh, she's great. We love her. Uh, Everly loves to drink whatever we have uh, as a drink. Uh, so if, if Nikki is, has a water bottle, which she, she usually carries a water bottle around even at the house, um, Everly will ask, uh, drink mama's water? Even if she's got her own. She's got her own water bottle. She always wants whatever we have. I think... All kids want do this at a certain age, or they just want whatever the parents have. Uh, so, a few weeks ago, um, you guys are going to judge me for this, but that's okay. Um, a few weeks ago, there was a, a glass sitting on our dinner table um, with Sprite in it. Um, and Everly said, drink mama's water. And before mom could say, no, that's not water, I said, sure, you can have a glass, a drink of mom's water. Um, Everly took the glass tipped it back, and of course, when you're expecting water, and you get Sprite, your, her face scrunches up, she, uh, she's like feeling the, the sour and the carbonation, and uh, she's like, that's, that's not water, I, I don't want that anymore, <laughs> Hand, hands it back. Uh, so why do I tell you this? Right, Everly, Everly's mistake, other than mistrusting her father, uh, was, was that she couldn't see the signs that the drink is not water, right? We can all tell when Sprite is Sprite and, and, and water is water. You see the little bubbles, the carbonation. There's, there's a, a test to be able to tell uh, when something is not water. I really couldn't do that. In the case of drinks, that's a, that, it's usually a, a harmless misunderstanding. You're, uh, nothing is going to happen to you if you accidentally drink Sprite instead of water. But however, in the case of, of teaching the Bible... And in the, our passage today, in the case of teaching the Bible, missing the signs of what is false can be detrimental to our faith. The passage today warns us to be discerning when it, when it comes to, to false teaching. And, and sadly, there, there is always a need for this warning. There was a need for it when John wrote this letter all those years ago to, to be discerning against false teaching. There's a need for it today to, to test what you hear. 
If we do not heed John's warnings here in, in chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, our, our faith could unravel as, as we forsake the, the teachings of Christ, as we're led astray from, from what the Bible teaches. For this reason, we, we must learn to discern what is true from what is false. Now, I had already, I had already sent the, the outline uh, to Donna that has just a couple blanks on your bulletin. Um, it doesn't have the what is true from what is false, uh, so that's why it's a little different. But if you're a, if you like to fill in the blanks on the bulletin, those those first few words there are what you're looking for. Today we're going to learn to discern what is true from what is false. Let me read here, starting in verse one. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. At the beginning of our series on 1 John, I, I gave you some of the context about uh, why he was writing, what's been going on in this time. And if you remember, or if uh, you've heard me, me talk about it the last several weeks as we've been going through it, in the context, there are these people who have left the church. And they've said, we don't believe that Jesus really was who he says he was. We don't believe that the gospels and the apostles' teaching. Uh, we're going we're gonna to break away from the church. And when we do that, we're going to try to pull as many people away as we can. So that's the, the context of what's happening. When John writes this letter, he's writing the letter to try to tell the church, stay strong. Don't give in. Know who is a true believer and who is a false believer. With this context, it's the, the underlying base for this passage. John is, is bringing this group up again as he challenges his readers to be able uh, to discern between true and false spirits. And when John uses the word spirit, like in verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. When John uses the word spirit, he's think like a, like a false prophet, a false teacher, the spirit of the teaching. Uh, he's, he's talking about these, uh, these teachers that are bringing a message that is opposite from that of the one he has brought. Basically, false prophets, what a false prophet is, is someone who claims to speak as inspired by the Holy Spirit. But in fact, they're, they're not. The, the New Testament speaks about these false prophets in a few ways, in, or in a few places. In, in Matthew 7, in Matthew 24, and in Mark 13, all of those are done by Jesus. As Jesus is warning his disciples, hey, after I leave, these false teachers are going to come in and try to, to muddy the waters. They're going to try uh, to, to pull you away from what, you, what I have taught to you. In 2 Peter 2, Peter also references these false teachers as, as a warning to stay away from them, to, to leave them be, to ignore them, to don't give them any kind of, uh, don't, don't pay attention to them. They're not the only references or, or warnings in Scripture to false teachers. It's just a couple that I pulled from the New Testament. Uh, but the fact that there are multiple should give us reason to take this seriously. To think about what would false teaching look like in our time, in our day. If we believe that there are false teachers and false prophets, uh, and, and John is telling us to test these spirits, to learn to discern what is true from what is false, the question then becomes how? How do we do this? How do we, how do we discern what is true from what is false? And the first way John uh, explains this is John encourages us to do this with Christ as our standard. In verse 2, it says, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. In verse 3, on the other side of that, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and is, in, and is now in the world already. As John explains his, his exhortation to, to test the spirits, he, he gives the readers a litmus test uh, that, 
uh, with, with the identity of Christ. He tells us that we can tell the Spirit of God is speaking through uh, a, a pastor, a preacher, a teacher, a Bible study leader, if that person gives the full account of Christ. John has used uh, this confession of Jesus Christ multiple times through his letters. Anytime he talks about the name of Jesus Christ, the, the confession of Jesus Christ, whoever confesses Christ, he doesn't just mean uh, a very simple uh, just acknowledging Jesus. What he means is acknowledging all of what and who Jesus is. The fact that Jesus was... Uh, the, the God-man come down in the, in the form of a man uh, to take on the sins uh, of his people, die a death he, he didn't deserve, rise again, defeat death, and, and bring life. He means that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is sovereign over all. He includes this full picture of Jesus. This is the litmus test that, that John is giving. The point in contention here is... Uh, that, that Jesus has come in the flesh. We believe, along with the apostles and Christians throughout history, that Jesus was a real man. Even, uh, e- e- even if you ask or, or look at research from um, atheists, scientists, skeptics, people that do not believe, they will all agree that Jesus was a historical figure. That he was a real person. He actually existed at this time. Where we differ as believers is that we don't just believe that Jesus was some uh, random man or just some ordinary person. Jesus was God in the flesh. We, along with the apostles and Christians throughout history, believe that, that Jesus came down in the form of a man. That he was God the Son incarnate who walked among his people. He lived a physical life, he died a physical death, and he physically rose again. If we don't believe that, then, then we are not believers. We are not Christians. We cannot claim to be a Christian without believing that Jesus physically lived, physically died, physically rose again. Now that's what John is, is, is providing here as a litmus test. You have to believe every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. John tells us that any spirit that confesses that is from God. Right On the other hand, though, that next verse, John tells us that any spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This would make sense, logically, right? This, this idea that for everybody that says we believe in this Jesus, this Jesus of the Bible, this Jesus that has been passed down from the apostles and the church fathers all the way down, anybody that confesses that is from God. On the other hand, somebody that preaches a different gospel, that preaches a different Jesus, is not going to be from God. You can tell a lot about somebody who is teaching the Bible based on the way that they, they talk about Christ is the full picture when, when you're hearing a lesson, a, a sermon, a, a message, is the full picture of Christ presented. Maybe you've heard, but hopefully not here, Jesus preached as one who is, who is so tolerant of, of all that he fails to judge sin, that Jesus would never judge anybody for doing anything wrong. On the other side, maybe you've heard, and again, hopefully not here, a Jesus preached who is, who is so legalistic that you feel condemned in, in your sin with, to the point of not being forgiven. Now, both of these pictures of Christ are, are faulty pictures of Christ. We, we serve a, a, a Savior who, as we'll see next week, is love, but we also serve a Savior who judges sin as you see in the book of Revelation. We see a Savior who, who offers grace and lavishes that grace on us because our Savior knows that, that we aren't perfect, that we can't live a perfect life. But we also serve a Savior who expects obedience, a Savior who is sovereign and Lord over all of our lives. Anytime you hear a Jesus preach that is not the full picture of Christ, know that that is not from God. 
the spirit that confesses the true Christ is, is the spirit of God. And uh, when, when Nikki and I were, were dating, we watched this show uh, called White Collar. Anybody seen White Collar? A couple people. Okay, White Collar is a, uh, it's, it's a show about the FBI. Um, it, white Collar is, it, it's about white collar crimes in the FBI. Um, one of the main characters, his name is Neil, uh, is a criminal informant. Uh, he is caught in the first episode. I didn't spoil anything. Um, it happens in the first, like, six minutes. Um, he's caught in the first episode. He's offered a deal to be a criminal informant by um, a, an FBI agent. And Neil specializes in art. Right? He's, uh, he, he's been a criminal for a long time doing art forgeries uh, and, and such. They bring him on to help with these white-collar crimes of art forgeries and and coin forgeries and antique forgeries because he's really good at it, but because he knows how to spot uh, the fakes. He knows how to spot the fakes because he knows the originals. Neil not only has the skills to to recreate uh, a piece of art or, or, or an antique, he has these skills to recreate it because he knows exactly what the originals are to look like. Now, when we think about uh, what it means to, to use Christ as a litmus test, to use Christ as, a, uh, as the, the test for whether a teacher is false or true, we have to know Christ. We have to know the Bible's picture of Jesus. We have to know who Jesus is. We have to know what the Bible says about what he has done and his identity. Hopefully, you, you see the the... the the application coming here, right? I'm serving it up. We can't know who Jesus is if we never spend time with Him. We can't know who Jesus is if we never read about what He has done and what He said and, and what was said about Him in Scripture. If you expect to ever be able to pick out and discern false teaching from true teaching, uh, you, then you must be able to open the Bible at home got to know who Jesus is. You've got to know who your Savior is. Right? There's a world that is out there that, that wants us to, to, to forsake the belief of, uh, of, that we have in Christ. There's a world out there that says, don't believe everything Jesus said. There's a, there's a world out there that says not, a, not all of his teachings can apply to a modern world. You're going to be bigoted and, and hated, and you're, you're not keeping up with the times. It'd be hard to pick those out if we don't know what Jesus actually said, if we don't know what Jesus actually did. All right, so, so when we think about knowing Christ, when we think about being able to tell the fake from the true, do we, do we know Christ well enough to be able to hold up what is fake to Christ and to know the difference? Do we, do we know what the Bible says about Jesus rather than what social media posts or TV shows or televangelists or our friend down the road might say about Jesus? Have we stood on his word uh, long enough and, and been in his word enough to know oh, that's not right? That's a false picture of Christ. That's not what Jesus said. Could we be able to pick out the true Jesus, from the most deviously disguised fake Jesus. Guys, in, in order to know true from false, we have to do so with Christ in mind. In order to discern between false spirits and the true spirits of God, John has given us this litmus test, this, uh, th- this fact of the identity of, of Jesus, with, with Christ as our standard. True teachers will speak truly and wholly of Christ, but this isn't the only thing that John talks about. It's not the only test. John also tells us to evaluate the response of the world. Before John gives us another method, though, he sandwiches in this verse, in in verse 4. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. You can hear the the pastoral tone that that John's got. He's, He's intimately talking to his people. Little children, let me encourage you with this, is what he's saying. He's giving them three, three encouraging truths from this, from this verse that's sandwiched in, how to discern true and false spirits. First, he says, they're from God. Second, he says, I've overcome them, them being the false spirits. 
And third, he says, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. What John is doing when he's writing, he's, he's giving this test on how to discern from true and false spirits. And uh, we know this. You, you hear uh, message after message after message of, of things that are contrary to the Bible. And over time, it can feel overwhelming. It can feel like, man, our, our world is a dark and twisted and sick place. And the messaging is just beating us down. John knows what's happening there. Uh, he may not know what is happening uh, now, but God, who inspired John to write this, did. Uh, they needed some encouragement. The saints needed to be reminded that they are from God. They will have ultimate victory over the false spirits and, the, and evil in the world because God has ultimate victory over evil in the world. And they will have ultimate victory because Christ is greater. Because the Holy Spirit is greater. So as, as John is giving this, this test, this exhortation to test the spirits, be able to decide between right and wrong, he's saying, as you're doing this, remember, you already win. You already have victory. The, the victory has already been won for you. With that, we can be, we can be encouraged. We can... Uh, we can attack, not attack literally, but we can attack this discernment of, of true and false with a renewed sense of vigor. In verse 5, John gets back to his test on how to, how to tell when, when a false spirit from a true spirit. He says, they are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. In verse 5, this subject, they, uh, refers to the false teachers, the false spirits. John writes that they're, they're from the world. They speak from the world. This, this second from, when it refers to speaking, speak from the world, can be thought of as the viewpoint of. So that it would read, therefore they speak from the viewpoint of the world. John is, is making sure that, that his readers, uh, they know that though these false teachers will seemingly speak the things of Christ, their message is ungodly and false. Really what they're doing is they're, they're speaking from the viewpoint of the world. Those who have left Christ or do not believe in Christ. Judging by the end of that verse, in verse 5, and the, the world listens to them, we can assume that these false teachers have accumulated a, a following in the world. John writes that, these, that the world listens to them. Now, we know that... The, or, Hopefully, in your, in your mind, there's, there's some kind of warning bell going off. Uh, and hopefully, it's informed by some scripture. But, but let's walk through this, right? As Christians, if, if the world has a gathering, uh, or a, a speaker has a gathering of the world, then we know that something is probably not right. 1 Corinthians 1, Paul writes that the, the message of the gospel is offensive to those who are in the world. In 2 Timothy 4, Paul writes that there's going to be a time when people reject the sound teaching of the gospel. They have itching ears for teachers to suit their own passions. Right? So, so based on scripture, false teachers will have listeners because they present something other than the true gospel. Right? If you've ever seen somebody who is a, a prosperity preacher, uh, a lot of these guys have really big followings. And they have really big followings because uh, it's, it's enticing. If I were to stand up here and say, uh, if you just have enough faith, you will never get sick. If you just have enough faith, you will be rich and healthy, and wise. Hopefully some of you would tear me down before I could say any more. But it's enticing to people. It's enticing to think that if we just check all of the right boxes, then everything's going to go right for us. Right? We live in a hard world. We live in a broken world where, where things go wrong. Where we're beaten down over and over and over again. And this promise from a false teacher that if you just believe, if you just donate to my ministry, if you just, uh, if, if you just show up, that everything will always go well for you. John tells us that's a, that's a false gospel. If the world is content with the message that someone is presenting, then we should be wary of that message. 
If an unbeliever can say, yeah, I agree with everything that person is teaching, then we should be a little wary of what that person is teaching. Now, I'm not saying that every popular preacher is a false teacher, right? But when we're listening, when we're gauging who we're listening to and what we're, we're taking in, we have to think, is this passing the test that, that John has given to us? Is he giving a full response, the full identity of Jesus? John writes these verses so that we will know the difference between those in the world and those from God. And, and so that we, we can evaluate the message based on the world's response. So now what? What do we, what do, we do with, uh, with, with these six verses? How do we apply this? How do we think about our lives? Verse 6 is John's declaration concerning those in God. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. John tells us to know the difference between the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. John tells us to test what you hear. If John were to come back today, in our modern time, in our modern lives, with, with our technology and, and media and all that we take in on a daily basis, what would John, what areas would John want us to use discernment? No doubt, since it was happening in his day, John would call for being careful when it came to our spiritual intake. Whether that's through the books we read, the, the podcasts and music that we listen to, the studies done through our church, the sermons you hear on YouTube or in person, everything should be judged based on Scripture and the confession of Christ. So I'll ask you, does, does everything you read or listen to line up? Are you feeding yourself with a watered-down message of Christ? My job up here is, is to preach the Word. To teach the church what the Bible says, to, to encourage us to live according to what the Bible calls us to do. And if it ever comes to a point where I am not doing that, where I am not preaching what the Word has said, I'm not preaching a, a message of Christ as, uh, as written down in Scripture, I hope that someone will say something. We need to take a look at our spiritual lives. Is what we're putting in, what God has called us to put in. If we're not hearing the right gospel, if we're not hearing the right biblical teaching, if we're not hearing the right confession of Christ, then it might be time to find something else. Find a new teacher, find a new Bible study, find a new church, but leave those false teachers behind. And in the context of this passage, John is, is speaking about false teachers who preach a message that, that sounds believable, but it's really dangerous, on, on the other hand, to the, the church's spiritual health. And of course, we can apply this discernment to spiritual things, but, but our discernment isn't left at the door when faced with the rest of our lives. Now, John is writing this, but John's not thinking about TV shows. John's not thinking about movies. John's not thinking about books magazines, in the news. We have to take this and go. We, we can have discernment when it comes to our spiritual lives, but we need to have discernment when it comes to every aspect of our lives. Our movies and TV shows and books and magazines are, are all trying to push an agenda. And, and I don't mean a, a political agenda, though some may do that. I mean that everything that is created is done with a worldview in mind. And everything that is created, that, that we take in and written and filmed, this worldview in, in many ways is different from ours. And in many ways, it's good to think broadly, to be challenged by what we hear and what we see in the videos and the movies and TV shows that we watch, to be challenged to think and to recognize where uh, a show is presenting a worldview that is different from ours. But the danger comes in when we begin to forsake the, the inerrant word, the inerrant scripture, the message of Christ for a value or a belief we saw in a movie or read in a book. Guys, will be honest, life in the 21st century requires discernment, requires sharp minds, 
requires sharp thinking about everything that we see and everything that we do. John does not want us to be led astray. John wants his church to hold tightly to the message of Christ, to hold tightly to the testimony of the one who came and gave his life for us. So when it comes to spiritual matters, we we can take an example from the Bible. We must be like the Bereans from Acts 17 who were commended for their scrutinizing of Scripture when, when Paul was teaching them. Right? Paul comes to teach the Bereans. They've heard of who Paul is, and they're still going, does this line up with the Bible, with the Word? When it comes to the world, we need to consider the verse that, that Regina read earlier, Philippians 4.8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Brett McCracken, in his book, it's, it's a great name, Brett McCracken, uh, but in his book, it's called The Wisdom Pyramid. Uh, he, he writes about our media intake, how we've flipped the pyramid and how this inversion is poisoning us. If, uh, if you're interested in the book, I have a copy. I'm more than willing to let you borrow it. It's, it's really good. Uh, but he writes in the introduction, uh, we must examine our daily diet of knowledge intake. It can be nutritious, making us wise and shrewd, more able to ward off intellectual infections and spiritual afflictions. But it, it can also be toxic making us unwise and more susceptible to the lies and snares of our age. So guys, is our, is our t- daily intake of both the secular and the sacred nutritious or toxic? Evaluate it all. Everything that you watch, everything that you read, everything that you see from, uh, from now until the end of time is what you're putting in, nutritious a toxic. John's passage exhorts his readers to discern between the spirit of God and the false spirits of the Antichrist. And for believers, this poses the challenge of, of picking through the messaging we hear on a daily basis. We must use discernment in everything. And for unbelievers, for those in here who have never given their life to Christ, the question then becomes, what's the alternative? Are you following a path that's, that's going to give you life? Because I can promise you that whatever the world is offering is not going to give you life. And especially not going to give you eternal life. For those unwilling, if there are skeptics that are here today, any unwilling to come to Christ is the alternative, life-giving. For those that need to hear it, I urge you to consider life in Christ. I urge you to consider His sacrifice, His death, his resurrection, as we, as we celebrate Palm Sunday today, the, 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 remembering, the time of remembrance where Jesus was brought in and praised as king the week before he was crucified. I urge you to consider the, the whole Jesus, the whole picture of Christ. Surrender your life to him today. Guys, as we think about 1 John 4, 1 through 6. Let's agree as a church, as a body of believers, to be wise. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have revealed yourself in it, that you show us that you love us, that you are good, that you're with us. God, we pray that you would help us to discern between right and wrong. Give us the wisdom to see. Give us the wisdom to to choose God, help us to walk wisely in your way. God, I thank you for this time. I pray that that you uh, continue to be with us as we we finish our our worship service and as we we head out back into our, our, our lives throughout the week. God, once again, we lift up Landon as... Uh, He is recovering. We we pray that uh, you would heal him, be with him, comfort him, and again, remind him that you love him. God, we thank you for all that you have done today. In Jesus' name, amen. You come this morning as the Lord leads.